Siblings and sisters and brothers, welcome to Tuesdays for Nurture. This is a webinar series where we faithfully focus on education for the people of God. We have topics from faith-filled politics to interviews of key leaders to how-tos in congregational life and the impacts of current realities on the life of the church. And today we're going to focus on a particular kind of education for the people of God in the state of seminary education. This is part of a series called The State of the Matter, originating from the theme of the State of the Union Address, where there are often goals about what's happening in the first hundred days and framing the work going forward. And yet, we notice that people often abdicate their, po their power to the people in the seats. It has become clear through our work across these last several months that the power is with the people. The question became, becomes not only what, what, what must we demand of the administration, but also what must we demand of ourselves? Therefore, over these past few months, the UCC has been engaging leaders to usher us into conversation and deep thought about our responsibility and our accountability in the changing from who we are to who we want to become. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you the Reverend Tracy Blackman, the Associate General Minister, who will give more context on this conversation and others. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much, Chris, and welcome to all of you who have joined us today. I am so excited about this particular webinar. We have our six partner seminaries all together, the leadership of those seminaries, here to discuss the state of theological education with us. And I just want to tell you my personal testimony. I went to seminary late. Um, and so one of the hallmarks of my adult life, other than adulthood, uh, is my seminary education. Um, my seminary education prepared me for the work that I do, not just the work that I do, but the way that I live. It wasn't just about learning what I needed to know, but learning how to learn and how to think. Uh, I was sharing with the presidents before you joined us uh, that one of my favorite quotes from the UCC is that our, our, our faith may be over 2000 years old, but our thinking is not. And I celebrate the seminaries that are on this call because certainly their thinking is not. These are progressive voices who are making sure that the context that we live in is addressed in the theological education we receive. So I'm not going to say much more than that. I'm going to introduce uh, Elizabeth Dilley, uh, who is going to moderate this conversation for us today. I am looking forward to it, and I hope that you are as well. Well, hello, good colleagues uh, here on the panel and beyond. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Adili. I'm the minister and team leader for the Ministerial Excellence Support and Authorization or MESA ministry team here in the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Um, in part of my role, I get to work with the Council for Theological Education, which includes the presidents, uh, deans, and directors of our seminaries and our regional theological education programs. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here today with some of the heads of our uh, seminary institutions, our UCC-related institutions. And I'm just going to ask them as we get started to introduce yourselves, say a little bit about uh, where you are and something you're really excited about at your institution. And I'm going to start with um, Ms. Elizabeth Bennett, who is the Vice President for Finance and Administration and the Chief Financial Officer at Lancaster Theological Seminary. So Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bennett. I've been at Lancaster Theological Seminary for almost nine years now. I um, of course, it's Lancaster's, we're in Pennsylvania, so we're actually just breaking out of our winter thaw here. And um, there are a lot of things that I'm really excited about right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about them um, later. But of course, I think most of you are aware that we currently are in um, talks with Moravian College, soon to be Moravian University. Um, and we're talking about 
potentially merging our seminaries. So Moravian's about an hour away physically from our campus. Um, we're keeping our campus, we're keeping our name. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later, but it's definitely an exciting time to be part of Lancaster Seminary. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a really exciting conversation that I'm following with great interest myself, actually. Um, simply because, not simply because it involves Lancaster, but because it's such an exciting um, opportunity. I'm next going to turn to Reverend Dr. Sarah Drummond, who is the founding dean of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. Sarah. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks, Elizabeth uh, Bennett, for naming how impossible it is to talk about one thing about which we're excited. I'm Sarah Birmingham Drummond. I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ uh, with my standing in the New Haven Association of the United Church of Christ. I've been part of Andover Newton since 2005, beginning as a faculty member, and now I serve as the head of school in our setting here in New Haven, Connecticut. Andover Newton has relocated four times in its history, most recently in 2016, but that doesn't change the fact that we still are the oldest one among us. So new location, old institution, and one thing about which I'm really excited, um, starting today is Andover Newton is uh, uh, organizing a summer reading program. Uh, my colleague, Associate Dean Ned Parker, has pulled together Andover Newton authors and our book club link, I just shared it with the group. Uh, so if you're looking for some guided reading with colleagues over the summer, uh, Andover Newton authors will be featured all summer long. And thanks for organizing that, Ned Parker. Sarah, thank you. I'm really excited for that link. So I'm going to be following that up too. Uh, Reverend Dr. Deb Kraus is the president of Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis. Deb. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really happy to be here with all my colleagues and friends in the UCC. And it's, it's a great opportunity to talk about our common work uh, in supporting the United Church of Christ and as we would say it at Eden, the progressive Christian movement, uh, acknowledging the broader ecumenical and then uh, progressive religious movements, interfaith connections that we have uh, locally, nationally, and internationally. I am really uh, excited to be at Eden Seminary as the president. Uh, I'm, I've served at Eden a little longer than Sarah. Um, I started on the faculty in 1992. So I've uh, been on the faculty teaching New Testament for quite a while. I've been the academic dean and I was uh, blessed to be uh, called to be the president uh, last year and began a little bit earlier than I think either David Greenhaw or I thought uh, I would in the COVID kind of period of handing it off. And what a year it's been. It's been an amazing year in many, many ways, uh, profoundly challenging and um, tragic year, and also institutionally uh, a time of profound learning and development. Oh no, I'm afraid that Deborah's technology might have just cut short her, oh, you're back with us. Deb, will you um, pick that up from that year of profound learning? That's when we lost you. Oh, so sorry. Um, uh, just a, 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 a remarkable year. Uh, so two things through that year that have been wonderful have been the opportunity to uh, have two colleagues join us on the full-time tenure track faculty who are really a part of equipping and empowering our engagement with the local community and with the national setting of the United Church of Christ and with our international uh, partners and colleagues uh, and alumni around the world. So uh, Reverend Dr. Sonia Williams uh, is our uh, new on the faculty assistant professor of practical theology and she's also our Dean of the seminary and uh, Reverend Dr. Dietra Wise Baker is our professor of contextual education and community engagement. And these two colleagues have been uh, remarkable uh, on the faculty uh, for a couple of years, and it's wonderful to have them join the full-time tenure track faculty. We're really looking forward 
to the ways in which they're going to expand and, and equip our outreach in the community. And uh, additional to that are the opportunities to align all of our programming, non-degree and degree, uh, with our goals of the curriculum. So we really brought in all of our different satellites into a, a, a kind of aligned and unified approach. Uh, our Walker Leadership Institute is now a part, integral part of the program's team and is equipping and bringing resources to our degree programs. So it's a, it's a time of, of real, I think, growth and uh, emerging um, uh, capacity at Eden for theological education for the church now and into the future. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to say the Mesa team celebrated both of those promotions loudly um, <laughs> in all our separate locations, but we were really celebrating that with you. So thank you. Um, while Deb and Sarah have been competing for longest tenured at their institution, I next want to introduce the Reverend Dr. Molly Marshall, who I believe is the newest um, person in her role. She is the new um, president at United Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities. Molly, welcome. Uh, Molly is gathering her thoughts um, and unmuting herself um, as she does so, and we're just so glad that she's with us. Thanks, Molly. Yes, thank you so much, and uh, forgive me for not being with you all uh, earlier. I've been waiting on some furniture to be delivered. I'm moving in today uh, here in St. Paul, and you know how things work. Uh, so forgive me for not being with you all earlier. Well, I am serving as interim of the uh, youngest of the UCC seminaries. I'm certainly not the youngest in this cohort of presidents, but I'm serving the youngest uh, of the seminaries founded in 1962, shortly after the UCC itself was founded in 57. And in many respects, we are an experiment of the UCC in terms of this widely ecumenical vision. And you can see that it's true if they would even invite a Baptist uh, to be their interim. I am uh, ordained as an American Baptist. Uh, we're some of the nice ones that, and it doesn't have to rhyme with root canal to be an American Baptist. So uh, we're, we're good folk. Uh, what I'm excited about here is uh, a couple of our programs one is social transformation that places us squarely uh, in the midst of very important conversations here in the Twin Cities. As you know, we claim the privilege of being here and that we have been at the epicenter of much of the Black Lives Matter movement and our faculty, staff, students have been very much a part of the public witness of this past year. And I take uh, inordinate pride in their efforts and that I have been privileged to join them. I'm also excited about our interreligious chaplaincy program. Uh, this is the fastest growing program that we have. Uh, and it holds forth an ideal for our students, that good pastoral practice in chaplaincy is respectful of the differing traditions that flow through those places, hospital, hospice, prisons, uh, juvenile halls, et cetera. And that uh, living with respect for the lived religion of others is a core value here. Uh, we've just hired a young woman, a, a womanist, a pastoral theologian, just finishing at Claremont, who will direct our uh, interreligious chaplaincy program beginning July 1, uh, Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape. And we are delighted. Uh, she's a UCC minister, and we're pleased that she will be uh, joining us. Another very thoughtful program that is emerging, led by a young African-American scholar, Dr. Gary Green, is sports activism. Now, don't anybody steal that idea. Basically, it is uh, how athletes are moving to claim public space as advocates. No more shut up and just dribble stuff. It's all about how to use the position 
in ways that, it, uh, that are constructive. And so we are uh, doing some good work in this emerging program. By grace and distance ed and really hardworking people in admission and enrollment, we are growing. Uh, we should have in excess of 200 students uh, this fall, which is the most that we've had in a good while. And we are celebrating that, celebrating that we'll be doing hybrid education, some in the classroom, some on the screen, but at least we'll be together more than we've been able to be. I'm grateful to be a part of the UCC family at this point. I've uh, long been respectful of the virtues of this church. They are my own values. And so it is a privilege to be in your midst for a season. Well, Molly, we're so grateful that you're in our midst as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that introduction and for some of the really innovative things that are happening at United. Thank you. And next, I want to introduce um, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Ray, who's the president at Chicago Theological Seminary. That's on mute. That'll be a helpful thing to begin with. So let me say how excited I am to uh, be able to be here and a part of this conversation. Just a little something about me is that I am an old New England congregationalist who finds myself in the odd land of the Midwest where there are congregational churches that do not have clocks in the back of the sanctuary. So that took me a long time to get used to a world without clocks in the sanctuary. But indeed, I am so happy to be leading Chicago Theological Seminary, which um, has the unique sort of uh, part of its identity that it was founded by abolitionists, specifically with the purpose of shaping people for ministry who would resist the growth of slavery back in 1855. And having been a product of Faith Congregational Church in Hartford, Connecticut, where the uh, um, Amistad uh, story begins, uh, this really feels like a great uh, and a tremendous opportunity to carry on these two important legacies. The thing I think I am most uh, excited about is the recent reorganization that we've gone through um, at Chicago Theological Seminary, which places our partnership with various communities, very specifically the Black community, the LBGTQIA community, the Muslim community, and the UCC in new ways at the very center of our existence. So we are staking our existence on being able to live fully into partnership with communities that we've been friends with. But we are seeking now to relate to them in different sorts of ways so that they become a part of the very substance of our being and not just places that we just go fishing for students. So I'm very, very excited about that because I think this offers some tremendous ways of us being able to reimagine theological education as a way to do more than create and prepare people for a uh, middle class, as it were, um, and upper class uh, congregations, but actually prepares people for ministry in a much broader range of being. So once again, so happy to be here with you. Say that part again, Dr. Ray, please say it again. <laughs> Not just about middle class and upper class. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank mm. you for that. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce uh, the president of my alma mater, uh, the Reverend Dr. David Vasquez Levy, the president of Pacific School of Religion. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you all. It is a privilege to be with you all, and one of my joys is actually to be in this conversation with a remarkable group of leaders of our UCC schools, and we look forward to the ways in which as we, it's exciting just to hear what everybody is doing in our work and how it's coalescing around uh, a response to a critical time in our world. It has indeed been a remarkable year, uh, a year of pandemic, protest, and polarization. And uh, in our conversations here at PSR, I've been here for six years uh, and serving as president. A, and we are in Berkeley, California. For those who may not be familiar, we're on the campus of UC Berkeley. 
And so an interesting place to engage this particular moment in the history of the world from this place, even as our courses and available uh, programs are everywhere, we're grounded in this place and in the East Bay, which is marked by Wakanda as uh, the Black, Black, you know, significant parts of Black Lives Matters movement uh, it began here in the Oakland area, just a part of our community. And so that has shaped who we are accountable to. It has really shaped our work and our education and our programs. And it is in this intersection between what's happening in Berkeley, what's happening in Oakland, and what's happening in Silicon Valley that is shaping a lot of our response to this moment. Um, what I'm excited, a number of things, as others have mentioned, a, uh, around our work together. I would say probably the most grounding element for me is a commitment to a preferential option for an emerging generation of people of color. I'll share a little bit more about that as we have our conversation, but for us, it is uh, similar to what Stephen has mentioned, right? That we need to shift the orientation of our institutions uh, to which are the communities of accountability on whose behalf we do our work and invite everybody, regardless of their background and experience, to be part of that work. For us, that's taken place in a number of ways. And one particular experience of that is through our Ignite Institute, which is a collective of an emerging generation of people of color. And these are folks across the country and around the world uh, who represent a wide variety of backgrounds. We have cohorts right now uh, in the middle of the crisis in Israel and Palestine. We have a Bethlehem cohort that's working with our program on wisdom-based leadership as well as programs across the country with different cohorts and uh, folks who are contributing from their own perspectives to reimagine what theological education is, not just as a degree orienting institution, but really as one that prepares and invites uh, folks to be in conversation with us from uh, their various traditions and experiences and work. So delighted to be together today. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for these wonderful introductions. It feels like it's a very rich um, opportunity to get to know each of these schools and each of you as well. Um, as we um, prepare to dig into some of the questions that we've talked about together, um, I wanna just say if uh, for all of our attendees, this is the time if you don't have a, a pen and paper handy, you might wanna get one because I'm yet to be in a conversation with these folk where I'm not frantically taking notes even as I'm listening. And although this conversation is being recorded, there are just these beautiful thoughts that, that I know we'll want to hold on to for a long time. Um, as we're beginning, we've really, um, you've, you've hit on a bunch of the areas that we will talk about in our time together. I want to note, um, this year we've had some uh, religious affiliation studies come out that indicate that this is the first year that 50% um, of folk in the United States are claiming no affiliation with a religious organization. Um, this, this is not a surprise that this has happened, but you know, it is of note. Um, and so one of the things I'm really interested from hearing from some of you about is how, how do you see this shift affecting theological education, both in terms of the need for theological education as well as the ways that that theological education is delivered. Start out a little bit of the conversation around that, Elizabeth. And um, I think that's a really critical statistic that many of us are very aware of. Uh, certainly the experiences of many folks in our congregations are experiences of a, you know, that concern many in, in religious circles, particularly Christian progressive institutions of the aging of the population and certainly in the country, but particularly within congregations. Uh, but I think to me, the simplest way to think about this for me is that the heartbeat depends on where you take the pulse in the body. And what I mean by that is it will be felt stronger in some areas than in others, right? The reality is that while there is a shifting in the way that people associate religiously, it is not actually accurate to understand that religion itself or the animating power of conviction and faith are diminishing as an agent of strength, orientation, and sometimes problematic engagement in the world. We certainly have seen a rise in religious affiliation in other parts of the world. A contrast to that statistic that you mentioned from the Pew Research is a study done by the uh, forum, the, the World Economic Forum, not exactly your most uh, you know, religiously affiliated group, 
but that projected already back in 2015 that the religious population in the world would grow 23 times faster than the non-religious uh, uh, community in the world. That's critical to ground our conversation here as a community of theological institutions on, because this reality really reflects the fact that the world and the importance of engaging religious, both religion, both critically and appreciatively is critical to the work of leadership in the world. I think it is the lack of an understanding of religion that often has affected the ways that we approach much of our global conflict and understandings and we miss the opportunity. That's particularly the case also in the United States where there is a divide depending on who we pay attention to. At PSR, we're speaking about this commitment to an emerging generation of people of color as a preferential option. This is language that comes out of the Latin American church in the middle of a period of conflict in which the church had to make a decision in the period of a significant conflict, which is what I, in the midst of what I grew up in in Guatemala, eh, about the church's orientation. Eh, Maria Teresa Davila talks about a preferential option as a cartographic shift. Basically, it's still the world of map, we understand that, but you flip it, right? Where are we focusing? A preferential option invites us to orient ourselves based on the experience of a particular community. And if we look at communities of color and emerging generational communities of color, the role of religion and faith and conviction is actually quite significant and strong. It doesn't look the way we normally have historically done it. So it does challenge us as progressive institutions, particularly those that are predominantly white, to think a little differently about it. I'll say one final thing, and I apologize it's going along, but the perception of nuns is something that is viewed primarily from a white perspective. If you think about secularism, in a way, it's almost like colorblindness. Only people in the majority can claim colorblindness, right? Because the assumption is that there is a universal experience of being human. Secularism runs the same risk of thinking that there are universal values that are human values, right? Rather than the particularity of religious traditions. The reality is that that is a dominant understanding of the world rather than one that reflects the reality of the multiplicity of belongings, ideas, and experiences that we have. It is difficult to really articulate things that are just universal unless you believe there is a normative way of being human. And so I would say that's where theological education becomes really critical. Okay, so if I could hop in and sort of build on uh, uh, what my colleague um, uh, David said, I think I would point to two things. First is that at least in terms of Chicago Theological Seminary, uh, we've recognized the need to begin to shift from the language of seminary education to theological education. And that is a critically important shift because the one has a way, has a connotation of being fundamentally uh, focused on clerical formation or preparing clergy for congregational ministry. And while that's an important vocation and an important work, what we need to do is we need to address so many other audiences now, because I too um, am a firm believer that people are no less religious but people are simply understanding and performing their religion in different ways. And so for us moving forward then, I think it's a matter of number one, asking the question, what does that range of religiosity look like? So from my perspective, it runs the gamut from people who are confessional people of faith. So for instance, I'm a dyed in the wool Calvinist who is a congregationalist uh, by practice in the world. And then there's a range of people whose simple belief in a human future of flourishing leads them to devote their entire lives to that cause. Now, neither one of us is less religious than the other in terms of devoting our lives to what it is that we believe is the single most important thing for us to do. So a part of what the challenge with theological education is to recognize and respond to that range of religious belief and do it in ways that are authentic to who and what we are. So we shape programming 
and we shape our ways of being in the world based upon one, how it is that we are in the world, because we have to recognize that we can't just make ourselves up. We have particular sorts of uh, anchors, uh, i.e. in the form of endowments, in the form of people who are on our board, in the form of alums, but these actually create a foundation upon which we can expand ourselves to the world in a much richer way. And I think one of the other pieces that becomes critically important um, uh, that we are focused on is in addressing people in terms of a range of religious faith recognizing the possibilities that that creates for interfaith engagement. So we, uh, a couple of years ago, began a partnership with the Bayan Graduate Institute of Islamic Studies. So now uh, they are fully a part of the work that we do. And a part of what was important for us was not to try to create a programmatic uh, response that would contribute to our bottom line, because then what ends up happening is we continue the practice of very much theological education of a colonial relationship with communities that we simply go into them with the object of extracting wealth, either in the form of tuition dollars, which are underwritten by student loans or in the form of asking people to support various programs while not responding to the actual needs of their community. So our concern was in this partnership that we were actually looking to change ourselves, that we were looking to evolve more fully into who God needs for us to be in this moment in time and where God needs for us to be in this moment in time. So I think those are the two things that I would lift up. Number one is to reshape and reframe the idea so that we're not talking about seminary education per se, even though that's part of what we do, but we're talking about theological education because we can deliver that in so many different ways and also building the kind of sustaining relationships with multiple communities so that we can address people across the range of faith and in that regard, bring all of the gifts of our tradition while we are inviting others to do the same. And if I could just follow up with that, and this is this kind of addresses this question a little bit more with the delivery methods. I think um, a lot of you probably know David Malott, who was our the academic dean at Lancaster Theological Seminary, um, and now is at, at Christian. Theological Seminary as president, but during his tenure as dean, he and I worked together, um, realizing that that ministry and a lot of education in general is you know people are becoming more bivocational and sometimes even trivocational. So what we did at, at, to change our delivery method is to create um, a two-track master's program. One was during the day, more traditional. And then the other program was on the weekends. So our students come in, you know, they can work during the week. They come in Friday, late Friday after work. They take a class. They Most of them stay overnight in our commuter housing. Saturday morning, they wake up, they go to chapel, they have class again. And so we have it set up so that it enables um, our students to be able to keep, you know, to keep a full-time job and then to also come to seminary on the weekends. And interestingly, what has happened with that program is that we have... Um, our day program continues to decline in enrollment, but our weekend program is increasing. And so what we've decided to do this year is just as, as, just as a test, um, we put the new students to the day program are on hold. And so we have the students who were already in our day program are continuing, but we are accepting students to the weekend program only. So, um, and no new students to the day program. And that's just kind of a shift in and like you said, the delivery method, like how do we, how do we meet the needs of our students who really, really feel the call to come to seminary? They want to be in seminary or, you know, to get their theological education, um, but they're unable to do it either financially or with other commitments that they've had. So um, that's one way that we've been able to address that. And then to piggyback on that, our, our doctor of ministry program has shifted um, a few years back to being more like almost 
you know, it kind of reminds me, and I think this is probably my CPA mind, but it reminds me more of like an executive MBA. You know, we have these two intensive weeks where the students come together and they're together for the entire week, but then in between they're doing more online um, learning. So, and those are, have been, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, now we're, we're talking with um, Moravian with their seminary and talking about the potential to combine with them. Um, mainly because you know, their ecumenical nature is very similar to ours, our theological perspective is very similar. And, um, but that's something that it really appeals to them as well. Like, you know, how do we, you know, they know their students are almost completely part-time, even they have a more traditional track, but everybody is, is part-time. So um, it seems to be, it seems to be very attractive to them, not just to have the doctor of ministry program where people can still work full time and continue to get their, their doctor degree or that they can continue to work full time or part time and um, get their master's, either their professional master's or master's of divinity degree. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's, I'm, I'm so encouraged both by the broadened scope um, that I see in terms of this isn't just about, you know, what are we doing as seminary educators, but as theological education, as well as how do we meet the needs of both um, those seeking seminary education, as well as that broader sense of those thinking of theological education. And that reminds me of something that Tracy Blackman and I were talking about a few weeks ago, um, that in the last 15 months, especially, we've experienced this uh, quite understandable explosion in digital ministry engagement and new models of spiritual communities. I mean, of course, digital ministry engagement has been happening before 15 months from now, as well as new models of spiritual communities have been always emerging. But we've seen a, a larger explosion of that um, during the COVID pandemic. And we're also seeing lots of really creative leadership on these digital platforms, um, sometimes with people who don't have formal training or ministry credentials. Um, and that's, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that flattening of access is certainly aligned with our Protestant commitments around direct access to the divine. And some of what Dr. Ray was saying about you know, whether one is formally aligned with a particular religious community may or may not have any impact on their sense of themselves as being spiritual or religious. So I think that flattening is commendable. I celebrate that. And yet, I will confess that some of what I hear occasionally uh, invites my, I call it worried wonder about things like community accountability um, and theological integrity. So I'm really curious about the roles that seminaries might have in cultivating the depth of spiritual engagement, particularly in these emerging communities, but also as a result of that new digital ministry engagement. I think, I think that's a, a really compelling question and way to think of it, Elizabeth. I've, I've been really since 2014 uh, with the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson and the uprising for justice in his name, um, a, aware of how both the kinds of uh, reflections that, that Stephen and uh, David and Elizabeth were offering in, in response to your prior question and, you, and this question um, are about creating movements and organizations of people outside of that traditional, uh, I think Stephen called it middle-class <laughs> way of organizing our religious thinking in denominations um, and, uh, and certainly in congregations as the, as the sort of primary vehicle in which, in which that's delivered or held. And, um, you know, I was reading a book uh, when I was a candidate for president at Eden by Adrian Murray Brown entitled uh, Emergent Strategies. It became a very popular book. Lots of people were reading it. And, uh, but it, it really got me thinking and I was yearning as I was reading it for how might some of this flattening 
and democratizing uh, of our thinking about religious life uh, be expressed in theological schools and be made available as resources to communities. And in some ways, I think um, COVID through the shove, particularly for a school like Eden that has been um, highly residential and slow to uh, adopt and adapt to uh, digital spaces and uh, technology to deliver and engage communities, um, how it really gave us a, a really powerful productive pressure, obviously, <laughs> to get into um, that, that way of being a school. And the, it's just been an incredibly powerful opportunity to see how in St. Louis locally, the uh, emerging movements for justice around Black Lives Matter and Ferguson um, and uh, how and you know immigration issues, how those spaces have connected more vitally with the seminary in our programming, um, how partnerships have been um, uh, more possible to forge, and then how this hyper local kind of approach has uh, been connected to the national constituencies of the United Church of Christ and our alumni who are serving in different contexts around the country, and then internationally, so that uh, graduates of ours in Sri Lanka who are uh, serving the uh, CACM, um, a partner congregation of, of the United Church of Christ and Global Ministries, and, and their recovery from the civil war there and their response to ongoing religious repression and human rights violations, how they, through digital access to the seminaries programs, are, are holding us more accountable. There's, in a sense, there's more accountability to your accountability question in some ways. Um, and uh, so that just that uh, powerful opportunity for building communities digitally that uh, are that we are able to share the content of our curriculum and our faculty and uh, be engaged in content and with constituencies that we otherwise would not be and that that is having a powerful reforming Im impact on our thinking about what it means to be uh, a theological school um, and and how that is providing for our students, many of whom are preparing to serve congregations, but an imagination of congregational ministry that is partnered, that is always seeking community partnership and always attending to the local context. And so I, I really think that the, the shape of the congregation is changing. Um, it's, it's not going away entirely. And as it changes, I'm excited to see how, uh, in particular, uh, these students and alumni who have been shaped and formed with this imagination and who are adapting to these new modes of uh, building partnerships in the digital space, creating, connecting regional, local, residential community with digital community, are learning how to do that are um, are really building a path forward. The spirit is moving in this, I believe, to uh, to create the church um, as as we're moving through it. So uh, it's it, it's it's wonderful to see, and it's also really encouraging to hear about programming. Molly, you were just you were sharing about this sports program. I mean, that's about creating religious, public, moral rhetoric in in public space and how that's available digitally you know how that gets shared through instagram and and different ways um really making powerful moral and and i think we could claim theological <laughs> though we wouldn't want to impose that but you know that that religious life is vital and alive to david's point um it's not on the decline and, and to see how, how the schools are, are providing programming that's bringing this to life is really exciting to hear.
Well, uh, thankfully, our sports activism program is not contingent on the successes of the Vikings or the Twins or the other <laughs> uh, local places. Uh, you know, they exist to make other cities feel better about their teams, I, I fear, at this point. Um, I think what uh, Deborah is talking about is this more permeable boundary between church and community and the questions posed by the movements, which really carry justice more ably than often our congregational life does, back and summons a response and for us to be more proactive as theological communities. Uh, now, in terms of speaking about the accountability when there may be a lack of theological integrity. Here I'm going really to sound like an old professor, uh, which I was. Uh, it's critical, I think, that we see the professor as a reliable guide, a person who interprets and helps guide folk to read well and to think well and to be able to distill and sift. And this is what public communities want uh, from theological schools. They want us not to be invisible on the social landscape. You remember Barbara Wheeler's warning years ago, don't be invisible. And so many of us have been. And thankfully, this particular epoch is calling us to a new openness, receptivity, malleability, and a new respect. A new respect for the spiritual longing, the desire, the engagement that is not confined within the church. The spirit has often had to do her work uh, parallel to congregational life because of our terrible uh, obdurate attitudes uh, about things. And so I see the new respect for the spirituality. I appreciate Stephen's notion that none comes out of a particular socio-cultural kind of naming. Uh, for us to talk about uh, how desire and longing are expressions of a deep spirituality, I think would go a long way in practicing regard uh, for the lived religion of others. Thank you. That's, yes, like, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for naming all of this. I mean, just so many of the shifts. You you also have talked about the ways that the movements um, of the last several years, you know, and, and really, which are in continuity with many decades of work, are really also reshaping some of the ways that ministry is understood in the world um, and in the church. So I'm wondering, you know, as we see this continued shift happen, to ministry beyond congregational settings. Um, what are your institutions doing to prepare leaders for those contexts or what sort of expanded opportunities are you excited about for that? I wanna make sure that we hear from Sarah Drummond um, as well from Andover. I know she's got some great um, thoughts and experiences to share in this regard at least. Well, all the questions that have come up are so are so interesting. This one catches my eye because of a topic that's been touched upon by my colleagues previously, which is um, the assumptions embedded in the questions, especially as it relates to taking a long term um, look back and a broader look to now and and the future. So graduate theological education. The idea that you go to college and then you go to graduate school to become a pastor has really in the grand scheme of the Christian faith been taking place for about a minute. The idea that theological education is a professional credential is even more recent. We could look back no more than 100 years to see that as in any way normative and in such a small part of the, the world. So I always get a little um, 
a little feisty at the question uh, about um, locating ministry in the church. Now, maybe that's partly because I've been in ministry for a long time and I get left off of a lot of lists because I've been serving in churches um, very, very short periods of time and a very small part of my portfolio, but serving in schools for a much bigger part of my life. And so I always get kind of at the kids table or the at a wedding, it would be the weird relative table where I don't feel like I'm necessarily invited to the conversation because I'm not serving a kind congregation. And so maybe this is just, um, maybe this is just me feeling like I want to stick up for those who are serving in other settings. But I also really chafe against language like bivocational or part-time ministry, because I find it to be a really um, uh, uh, modern, <laughs> A modern conceptualization of what a profession really is, that ministry has never endorsed, that with which ministry has never conformed. Spiritual leadership has not fallen into these assembly line categories at any point where we were doing anything right. So with that, I think we see a lot of exciting freedom in the future because the generation that's coming up is a generation that's been formed in a gig economy. And the past year where we've seen that people are able to perform, uh, to perform professional responsibilities from different locations than they have before, I think further loosens us up. So do we or do we not um, do we or do we not uh, focus on ministry in congregations or outside congregations um, in a box with a fox? I just don't think that's the question anymore. I think the question is, where do we get our spiritual leadership from and how do we ensure we have a learned, a learned um, spiritual leadership that's able to spot it when religious leadership language is being used to promote an agenda that is bad and wrong. So with that said, I would say that uh, at Andover Newton, the language we use is that, look, we love the church. We consider the church to be home base of spirituality in our, our tradition, but we understand ministry as a much broader category. And that's that for which we're educating our students. Oh my goodness. I just, I'm so glad that the mute was on because I was hollering, <laughs> I mean, was just, uh, which is basically what happens whenever I am fortunate enough to be in a room with all of you. Um, I, I said to the panelists that we, uh, we're going to have to have you back because I would like to continue this conversation and continue these conversations. I know that those who are watching now, whether it's live or at some future date, are going to have more questions uh, that we have not had time to address in our time together. Um, and I, I, you know, I simply love to, to listen to the ways that you all engage these important questions. So I want to thank you so much uh, for our time uh, today. Um, each one of you know that I am praying for our institutions that the whole church is lifting you all up in prayer as we continue to move forward. Thank you for this time, friends who have been with us. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it now over to Chris Davies and to Tracy Blackman uh, to end our hour today. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, my, my own theological formation was formed by uh, so many of you in various ways, even as I've continued this work of being in covenantal relationship with our seminaries and theological education outside of seminary, all beyond. And I know that this has been an ongoing gift to those who are listening. And if you are listening and this conversation has mattered for you, given you things to think about, things to pray about, please consider donating to the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444, or you can go to the website at ucc.org and find the donate button. I also want to let you know about some upcoming conversations. On Thursday of this week, we're going to be offering a worship service in Spanish uh, that is Pulse five years after. On Tuesday next week, we'll be talking about sexuality and the Black church. 
And then we'll look into Synod a little bit on Thursday after that. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to invite the Reverend Tracy Blackman to pray us into the rest of our day. This has been quite a rich conversation, and I hope that we will do it again. There's so much more uh, to talk about. This past year has been a traumatic year for all of us. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, and in my opinion, the voice of faith has been at the center of that. It is the education that you provide, the vast theological education that creates space for everyone to be seen and to be heard that has been the counter voice to what we have heard so much of in these last four years. It has been our way of being able to communicate, not just a God that we preach about, not just God's people that we talk to, but a lived reality of what we have learned in our institutions and in walking out our faith. It is what gives us the courage from a scriptural background to speak truth in power to white supremacy, to nationalism, to heterosexism, to xenophobia, to, hom to homophobia, ev every kind of ill and hate. You help us find that language. You help us look beyond just the written words of the Bible and understand what the Bible is saying. You do that. You do that in a way that no one else does. You help us learn to deconstruct things that we have lived our entire lives with in safe spaces. And then you help us build something that we can live into. So I wanna say thank you. That's not easy work. I would love to be a fly on the wall every beginning semester when people show up just as I did with all of their Sunday school arrogance and have their whole world blown apart only to figure out that you can live with the pieces in a safe space and put back together a faith that you can actually defend. I wish for a world where people across faiths can begin to communicate together once again and if there is any hope for that, it is found in the progressive theological education you provide. I was supposed to pray, but I moved. So the prayer is very, very short. May it be so, amen. Beloved in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed into the rest of your day and know that you are not alone. We are holding you in prayer. Amen.